Hi, welcome to the Chapter 4 screencast on tissues. Uh, you have just four different classifications of tissue, epithelia, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. Um, so any little chunk you take out of the body is going to fall into one of these four categories. As you're going to see, some of these categories contain a, a number of different types of tissue, but they're all still classified together um, for sound biological reasons. First up is epithelia. Um, as it says here, epithelia line all of your surfaces. So the surface of your skin is an epithelium, and all of your inner surfaces, like the inside of your lungs, your gastrointestinal tract from your mouth, all the way to the other end is lined by epithelial cells, um, your blood vessels, all of your glands, any surface is lined by an epithelium. And all of the epithelia have these six different characteristics. Um, in the file I posted, polarity is over here instead of being part of the list. I'm not sure how that happened. I'm sure it's my fault, um, but now I've fixed it here. You should fix it on your slides. Um, so first up, polarity. Um, this is not what your skin looks like here, but let's just imagine that I chose a picture of skin, right? The surface of your skin isn't attached to anything because it's on the surface. So that would be the apical surface of the epithelium on your skin. The, or I should say, underneath your skin is another tissue layer underneath your epidermis the epithelium of your skin is the dermis. So the top layer of your skin versus the bottom layer of your skin is going to be different. The top layer we call the apical surface. The bottom layer, which is attached to whatever that epithelium is lining, is called the basal surface. Um, and the cells themselves have differences inside of them um, apical versus basal, like here the nucleus is closer to the basal surface and the apical surface in the case of this epithelium is um, secreting some sort of substance. Um, epithelial cells also tend to have lots of contacts in between them, um, predominantly tight junctions and desmosomes. Um, so the tight junctions are there to make sure that whatever is on one side of the epithelium stays on that side of the epithelium. So remember those are the watertight junctions that prevent water and solutes from sneaking in between cells. And then the desmosomes are what hold the epithelium together and then attach the epithelium to any tissue that's underneath it. In this case it's some sort of connective tissue and we'll talk about what a connective tissue is in a few minutes. Um, epithelia are also avascular, which means they do not have blood vessels. Right? So if you scratch your skin and it doesn't bleed, then you've just disturbed the epithelium. If you scratch your skin and it does bleed, you've gone through the epithelium into the connective tissue underneath it where you find the blood vessels. You do find nerve fibers in epithelia, not however in the example I have chosen, but you're going to see when we get to skin, there are specialized neurons that live in the epithelium of your skin that give you sensation. Um, all of your epithelia are connected to some sort of connective tissue underneath them, um, and they have what is called a basement membrane. This is a little bit difficult to explain, but a concept that I want to introduce here, because when we do skin and the skin cancer case study, which we're going to expand upon, we want to understand what a basement membrane is. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead. Um, so you can just think of it as a layer of interconnected proteins, and you want to remember that it's way different than a cell membrane. Um, so Biologists use membranes, or use that term membrane, to describe a number of different structures. So right here, this yellow line represents the plasma membrane, or the cell membrane, of a skin cell. And then the basement membrane 
is all of these interconnected proteins here. Um, sort of a real life analogy of what a basement membrane might look like is a chain link fence. Right? It is tough and structural. Big things can't cross a chain link fence, but small things like water and wind and chipmunks and squirrels and even little rocks can make it right through the links of a chain link fence. Um, this is another picture of a basement membrane, which I borrowed from somewhere. There, it's referenced there. And I have the picture upside down so that what you're imagining here is you're looking up at the underside of this skin cell right here. So you're in the dermis, the connective tissue, underneath the cell layer on the surface of your skin. And this gray structure here would be the cell membrane of the basal surface of your skin. And then underneath it is just this network of proteins that connect your skin to the tissue underneath it and form a mechanical barrier between the outside world and the inside world. So there are structures like this, basement membranes, that separate your tissue layers and all of your organs. So later on when we're talking about cancer and cancer cells being invasive versus non-invasive, we mean they have the ability to disassemble and pass through basement membranes like this. Um, what else do we want to know? Your epithelia are easily regenerated. They all have this capacity because they are all lining surfaces. Surfaces tend to take damage or friction. Um, so you're always going to be losing epithelial cells that then have to be replaced. Uh, let's see, we are going to talk about the classification then of epithelial cells. There's generally speaking a two name or a two word classification system. Um, so you start with whether an epithelium is simple or stratified. Uh, simple means one cell layer, stratified means many cell layers. And then you indicate the shape of the cell. So squamous cells are flat, cuboidal cells, as it says, or as it sounds, are cube-shaped or square. And then columnar cells tend to be tall, like skyscraper or apartment buildings. So then you put the two together, oh, whoops, um, you put the two together to name the epithelia types. I got ahead of myself. Um, as we go through the epithelia types, for each one you want to know its description, its function, and location or an example of where you would find that type of epithelia in the body. So first up, simple squamous epithelium. So as the name implies, it is one layer of flat epithelial cells. And so these are your flat epithelial cells. The gray underneath it is the basement membrane. Um, these are found in a couple different places in your body. They tend to, because they are thin, allow materials to pass between them, and in some cases generate lubricating fluid. This example here is the air sacs of your lung. So basically, you're looking at a sheet of cells like this sideways. Um, so like picking up a plate and instead of looking down at the plate, I'm looking at it thin side like it were a frisbee and that's the view of simple squamous epithelia that you have down here. Um, so this is a picture of what it looks like in the lung. Most of the other places in the body it's going to look like this. So the inside of your lymphatic vessels, your blood vessels, and the membrane that lines the outer surface of all of your visceral organs, your digestive organs, it's just a thin protein membrane with one layer of cells on top called a serous membrane or serosa, which we'll talk about later in this chapter. Then you have simple cuboidal epithelium, so it's a single layer of cube-shaped cells. They can be adapted either for secretion or absorption, and you find them in the kidneys and then also in small glands. Um, like parts, some of your sweat glands and some of your salivary glands. Sweat glands and salivary glands 
are sometimes simple cuboidal epithelia and sometimes stratified cuboidal epithelia. Um, but that is what they mean by small glands. Uh, and the epithelium is right here. So here is your tube. This is a slide from kidney. So here's your little hollow space. And then this is the epithelium lining the surface, um, small cube shaped cells. Then your simple columnar epithelium is, again, one layer of columnar shaped cells or tall rectangular cells. These tend, when you look at them, to have an oval shaped nucleus, which is usually situated towards the basal surface of the cell. So if you look over here, this line of cells right here, this is the simple columnar epithelium that lines your intestinal tract or your digestive tract, mostly your intestines. Um, your stomach also has a simple columnar epithelium, but it looks a little different than this. Um, so here again, this is the epithelium lining the inside of your intestines. And if you zoomed in on this layer right here, it would look like that, a single layer of columnar cells. And as I've said multiple times now, you find simple columnar epithelium in the digestive tract um, and then parts of your respiratory tract, your bronchi, and then uterine tubes. Um, but I always just say digestive tract because we're not going to look at uterine tubes under the microscope in anatomy and physiology too. Then you have what is called pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Um, it is called pseudostratified because it looks stratified, but it's not, and the cells are columnar in shape. The only place we care about that we are going to see this is your trachea, or as this says here, upper respiratory tract. Um, and if you look here, right, it's a mess. You've got nuclei that look like they're stacked one on top of another. But if you look over here, the way it actually is organized is that all of the cells do extend from the basement membrane or basal surface all the way up to the apical surface, but the nuclei are not uniformly found near the basal surface. And the cells kind of twist around each other so it can look like, you know, this nucleus is stacked on top of that nucleus, so this cell looks like it's on top of that cell, but they all extend from the bottom to the top. We're not going to worry about the function of pseudostratified columnar epithelia so much. You just want to know that it's found in the trachea. Then you have stratified squamous epithelium. So this is many layers of flat cells. It is primarily for protect protection and primarily protection against friction of different sorts. So you find it in the esophagus, skin, and vagina. These are both examples from our lab that I took with our microscope of skin. So here would be the bottom of the epithelium. So this is where there would be a basement membrane. And then everything from here all the way up outside the view of this picture is all the epithelium. These epithelial cells here are all alive. These are the dead skin cells on the surface. In this picture, um, the, it's, the magnification is lower. So this is the basal surface or where the basement membrane would be. That darker purple layer is the epithelium. And then that grayish line right there is the dead skin cells on top. So all of this and all of that is connective tissue that your epithelia or yeah epithelium sits on top of. Then you have transitional epithelium. Um, this doesn't have the standard two word naming convention. It's just called transitional. Um, it is a stratified epithelium and it is marked or you know you're looking at transitional epithelium when you see what they call dome shaped cells on the surface. So they're kind of rounded on the top as opposed to being cuboidal. Um, transitional epithelium stretches. So you can go from an epithelium that looks like this, where all of the cells are round and squishy. And if you stretch it out, all the cells are going to flatten out. And it would look then more like your 
skin or your stratified squamous epithelium when it's stretched. Um, so it is found in the places of your body that stretch like your bladder, your urethra, and your ureters. If you don't know the difference between these two yet, the ureters are what connect your kidneys to your bladder, and your urethra is what connects your bladder to the outside world. Um, and all of those three structures expand when they fill with urine. Um, then we get into just a, a little bit of detail about different kinds of epithelia. Um, covering epithelium versus glandular epithelia. And mostly what you want to know is the difference between an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. Um, and this also, if you look at this, shows us the difference between a covering and a glandular epithelium. So in these two tissues, this would be your covering epithelium here and your covering epithelium here. And then this would be the gland down here. So this is what like a sweat gland in your skin might look like. Um, and then over here, these cells here are your glandular tissue. Um, so if there is no duct or common pathway for the secretion, that is called an endocrine gland. Endocrine glands, um, as I just said, are ductless, and they also secrete things into the bloodstream, so their secretions tend to stay within the body, hence endocrine. And exocrine glands have a duct in them, a common passageway into which the secretion is dumped, and their secretions tend to exit the body, either the surface of the skin, like sweat, or being excreted from a digestive gland into your lumen of the digestive tract, which is actually considered outside of your body. It's not an internal fluid compartment, right? Because the contents of your digestive tract are on their way out the other end. Uh, let's see, this is just other glands and we don't really care, so let's just skip over that. Uh, now we get to connective tissue. Um, this is a very broad category. The definition of a connective tissue is, as it says right here, it is cell cells suspended in an extracellular matrix. And then the matrix is composed of protein fibers plus some sort of ground substance. So that is really the stuff that the cells are suspended in. Uh, and just to give you sort of a analogy of epithelia versus connective tissue because I think connective tissue is sometimes difficult for people to wrap their heads around, right? If we envision every stone as being a cell, then this wall here is kind of like a stratified squamous epithelium, right? It's mostly stones, so all cells, epithelia, are mostly cellular with very little space in between the cells. Connective tissue can be or can have fewer cells and lots of non-living ground substance and proteins in the extracellular space. So this piece of concrete, if you imagine all the little stones or cells and everything that's the gray concrete color is extracellular matrix, you can see that there's a lot here that is matrix, a, a lot that is not a living cell but non-living extracellular matrix. Um, so to give you an example of just sort of how broad this category is, your blood qualifies as a connective tissue because it is red and white blood cells suspended in a fluid ground substance called plasma. Your bone is also a connective tissue. So it is osteocytes, and that's what all these little gray blobs are here suspended in a mineral ground substance along with protein fibers. Now because connective tissues can be anything from blood to bone, they are not as uniform in their um, description. They don't have all the same uh, characteristics like epithelia all shared a lot of common characteristics. So we're not going to really worry about this list too much. Now, the two things that all connective tissue have in common is, one, they all meet that definition 
of cells suspended in an extracellular matrix. And two, as it says here, they all have mesenchyme as their common tissue of origin, meaning in a developing embryo, you have a connective tissue called mesenchyme, and mesenchyme can turn into bone or blood or cartilage or adipose. So all of the connective tissues started out as mesenchyme, and this is why it is biologically accurate or intellectually honest to classify bone and blood in the same tissue category because they have the same embryonic origin, which is mesenchyme. Um, so those two are definitive and make the category what it is and are something that you want to remember because they're definitive. Um, then uh, connective tissues, as it says here, have varying degrees of vascularity and innervation. So some of your connective tissues have lots of blood vessels and some of them not so much. Um, some of them can regenerate like adipose tissue um, and areolar connective tissue, which is a very uh, loose generic connective tissue. Some of them don't generate very well at all, right? If you've ever damaged one of your tendons or ligaments, you know they don't heal very well. Um, or if you've damaged cartilage in your knee, um, you know that also doesn't heal or repair and regenerate itself very well. Um, in the extracellular matrix, we said it was ground substance plus protein fibers. There are three major different protein fibers that you find in your different connective tissue. Um, collagen fibers, um, these as it says here are thick and strong and therefore support and they're what make connective tissues tough. And collagen is the name of the protein that is woven into these big thick fibers that we call collagen fibers. Um, so when you're looking at a collagen fiber, you're looking at millions and millions and millions of collagen molecules all glued together to make this big thick fiber. Reticular fibers are also manufactured from collagen, but they are thinner and they tend to form um, a scaffolding or almost like a cargo net um, and are for cells to attach to, so they're not quite so much structural. And then elastic fibers are obviously for elasticity and they are composed of a protein called elastin. Um, then you do have um, different cell types that are found in different connective tissues. Before we go into specific cell types, we want to understand the difference between a blast and a site, because we are going to see those two suffixes or endings used quite a bit. Um, if a cell is still dividing or secretory, it's used to build things, right? Either of these two uh, it means you're making stuff. You're either making more cells or you're making some sort of secretion. That is a blast like a fibroblast makes collagen. And then mature cells that are no longer dividing, we call sites. Like your chondrocytes are the mature cell type that you find in cartilage that is not growing or dividing. Immature cartilage or cartilage that's still growing, like the parts of your skeleton that are still growing, um, would have chondroblasts that are dividing and chondrocytes that are no longer dividing. Um, same thing in bone, osteoblasts secrete bone matrix, osteocytes are just the mature cells that you find in bone. Hematopoietic stem cells, we're not going to worry about this word at all right now, um, but you do want to know this word macrophages. Um, so a macrophage is one specific kind of phagocyte. A phagocyte, I don't think we've mentioned this before, is a cell that specializes in phagocytosis. So if you remember from chapter 3, right, phagocytosis is a form of endocytosis where you are internalizing things into the cell using vesicles and then digesting them. So macrophages are derived from one of your blood cells and crawl out of the bloodstream into tissues and they physically digest, ingest, and then digest things that aren't supposed to be there, like dead skin cells, 
bacteria or little bits of damaged protein. So when it comes to the connective tissue types, when we go over the description, you want to think, what, what is the ground substance? What kind of protein fibers do you find there? And what kind of tissues do you, or excuse me, what kind of cells do you find in that connective tissue type? Um, where might you find that connective tissue in the body? And what are the physical or physiological properties of that connective tissue? Um, so first up is areolar connective tissue. Um, as this says right here, it's not in the OpenStax book, but it is a very widely distributed, important connective tissue. This is basically, in addition to adipose tissue, kind of the packing peanuts of your body. Areolar connective tissue shows up in lots of different places. Um, so we're not going to worry about its function so much because it shows up in so many different places. Where we are going to see it a lot is underneath epithelia. So that is the primary connective tissue that all of your epithelia are connected to. And when you find it underneath the epithelia, that specific form of areolar connective tissue we call lamina propria. So here again is the picture of small intestine that we used when we talked about the simple columnar epithelium. And all of this stuff here is the areolar connective tissue that is supporting the simple columnar epithelium in this slide of small intestine. So in this case, we would call this areolar connective tissue here lamina propria. Uh, then you have adipose tissue. Uh, this was also a typo. I No, wait, there, the next one was a typo. Um, I found a couple of pretty major typos in these as I was preparing for this screencast, so I, I apologize for the typos that are still posted on Canvas. Uh, most of you are familiar with adipose tissue. Um, it contains adipocytes um, or fat cells. It is there for energy reserves and it also uh, provides insulation. So your subcutaneous fat or the fat underneath your skin helps keep you warm. And it's also packed in and around or around, I should say, certain organs like your eyes and your heart to provide um, physical protection to those organs. Um, and then where it's located, it's already right there. So under your skin, um, by your kidneys, eyes, and heart, where it's providing uh, physical cushioning. Next up is reticular tissue. Um, this is, or I should say, it is sort of defined by the presence of reticular fibers, um, which make a loose network of protein scaffolding that cells attach to. So when you look at this picture over here, all of this dark spider webby looking stuff is reticular fibers, and then all of the purple is the nuclei of cells. So you can see there's quite a few nuclei, and they're attached to the reticular fibers Reticular tissue, you tend to find lots of phagocytes there and also other immune cells that we're not going to name. Um, there should be ophagocytes, so macrophages is what that should really say. Um, and what your reticular tissue does is filter things. So this is, you can think of it like the charcoal filter in your Brita and lymph, um, which is a fluid that leaks out of your bloodstream is going to trickle through the reticular tissue and pass through all of these little spaces in between the cells and then the cells are going to process and filter the fluid as it flows through. But the cells stay where they are because they're stuck to the reticular matrix and the fluid flows through it. Then you have dense regular connective tissue. Um, it is dense because it contains lots of tightly packed collagen fibers and they all run in parallel to each other. Um, so it's just this red stripe that runs from here to here, this layer of this slide that is the dense regular connective tissue. Um, so as it says here, parallel collagen fibers that are secreted by fibroblasts, um, and it has what is called tensile strength, um, like a steel cable or a very strong rope, um, and this is what your tendons and ligaments are made up of because they deal with um, 
linear forces that like a rope or a steel cable might deal with if you're suspending something from a steel cable. Um, that's what your tendons and ligaments do is deal with those linear forces. Then you have dense irregular connective tissue, um, which again contains a lot of collagen secreted by fibroblasts, but now the fibers don't all run in a parallel fashion. They form more like a cargo net or a spider web. So instead of just having strength in one direction, uh, you can apply force to dense or regular connective tissue in lots of different directions and it's going to resist deforming too much. Uh, you find dense irregular connective tissue as the dermis of your skin. Um, so here this is skin, here's your epithelium again, and this stuff down here is your dense irregular connective tissue. Um, there is a very thin layer of areolar connective tissue, lamina propria, supporting the epithelium here and also if you look closely this little bit right here and that little bit right there those are little parts of sweat glands so you've got some cuboidal epithelium suspended in this dense irregular connective tissue and um, so for us we're going to think of the dermis as being the primary example of dense irregular connective tissue it also makes up your joint capsules and the submucosa of your digestive tract when we get to anatomy and physiology too. Um, I could point it out. Where's this slide? Um, this layer, no, this layer right here, this blue layer, is the dense irregular connective tissue or the submucosa of your digestive tract. Um, so you've got your mucous mem... Oh, we're not going to go into it. Getting ahead of myself. Where were we? We were on dense irregular connective tissue. Elastic tissue, we're not even going to worry about. Who cares? Um, then we have membranes. Um, there are two different categories of membranes. Membranes that have cells associated with them, or epithelial membranes. And then membranes that are just like the basement membrane, really. Um, it's a series of proteins all glued together to make um, a membrane or a sac. So those are your synovial membranes which we won't really talk about in this chapter because they're covered in the chapter on joints. And skin or cutaneous membrane is going to be its own chapter. So we are just going to focus on mucous membranes and serous membranes. Um, I have stolen this picture down here from earlier in your slides. So if your slide does not have this, but your PowerPoints do. Um, so mucous membranes, as it says right there, line all of the body cavities that open to the exterior world. So from your mouth all the way to your anus, your digestive tract is one long tube that's connected to the outside world. So it is lined by a mucous membrane, as is your respiratory tract. So beginning in your nose, all the way down, trachea, bronchi, lungs, all mucous membrane, and your urogenital tract. So start at your urethra, where the urine comes out, and follow that all the way back to the kidney. That's all lined with mucous membrane. They do all look a little different, but they do all have the same basic structure in that they have an epithelium, which is the apical surface, attached to a basement membrane, supported by lamina propria. Um, and this is supposed to, you're supposed to write in here, the connective tissue type is areolar connective tissue is supposed to go in there. Um, so again, this is the mucosa or the mucous membrane of something small intestine. And this layer right here is the epithelium along with this little bit of internalized epithelium. Then all of this stuff is your lamina propria and separating the two is a very, very thin, so small that you can't see it with the microscope, basement membrane. Some of your mucous membranes have goblet cells. That is where some of the mucus comes from. Uh, and I don't see goblet cells in the mucous membrane that I have picked. Um, your small intestine doesn't have as many goblet cells as your large intestine. Um, there are glands within the intestine that make mucus for it instead of goblet cells that are part of the epithelium. 
this is my last slide. You have two that you should just delete after it. Um, serous membranes. Um, and again, I have stolen this figure, right? This is our example of a simple squamous epithelium. And this is what a serous membrane looks like. It is just a protein membrane similar to a basement membrane with one layer of flat cells on top of it. Um, and these are used to wrap around organs and line body cavities. Um, so you have three different serous membranes. Um, you have a pericardium that surrounds your heart, the pleura that surrounds your lungs, and the peritoneum which surrounds your abdominal cavity. Um, so if you were to say cut a fetal pig open, which you will do at the end of Anatomy and Physiology 2, and you're looking in the abdominal cavity, you're going to see a whole bunch of organs. Each one of those organs is covered with a membrane that looks like that. That would be the visceral peritoneum. So this would be attached to the outer surface of the stomach. If you then were to look at the body wall, right, the, the inner surface of the abdomen that you just cut open, it would also be lined by the same serous membrane. So this would be attached to the inner body wall, and this would be facing the organs. And so same thing for your lungs and your heart. They both have a membrane that covers the surface of them, plus it, that same membrane lines the body cavity that they find themselves in, and these membranes, you may recall, secrete fluid, because that's one of the things that a simple squamous epithelium can do. So you have uh, two layers of membrane with a little fluid in between them, um, keeping your organs from sticking to your body wall or preventing your lungs from rubbing up against your ribs. Um, so that's it. That's your serous membranes. We'll cover them more um, when we get to the individual chapters that include heart, lungs, and abdominal cavity. Um, and that is it for this chapter. Thanks for hanging in this long.